All right. Let us let us pay attention to the word inspired by God. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all. The most important place on earth, it will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come and say, come, let us go up the mountain of the Lord to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways and he will walk in his path. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. The Lord will mediate between peoples and will settle disputes between strong nations far away. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will no longer fight against nation nor train for war anymore. Everyone will live in peace and prosperity, enjoying their own great wine, uh, grapevines and fig trees, for they will be nothing to fear. The Lord of heaven's armies has made this promise. Though the nations around us follow their idols, we will follow the Lord our God forever and ever. In that coming day, says the Lord, I will gather together those who are lame, those who have been exiles, and those who have I fill with grief. Those who are weak will survive as remnant. Those who are exiles will become a strong nation. Then I, the Lord, will rule Jerusalem as their king forever. As for you, Jerusalem, the citadel of God's people, your royal might and power will come back to you again. The kinship will be restored to my precious Jerusalem. But why are you now screaming in terror? Have you not, have you no kin to lead you? Have your wise people all die? Pain has gripped you like a woman in childbirth, right? And grown like a woman in labor, you people of Jerusalem. For now you must leave the city to live in the open country. You will soon be sent in exile to distant Babylon, but the Lord will rescue you there. He will redeem you from the grip of your enemies. Now many, many nations have gathered against you. Let her be desecrated, they say. Let us see the destruction of Jerusalem. But they do not know the Lord's thoughts or understand his pain, his plan. These nations don't know that he's gathering them together to be beaten and trampled like sheaves of grain on a treasure floor. Rise up and cross the nations, O Jerusalem, says the Lord. For I will give you iron horns of, and bronze hoops. hoops. You can trample many nations to pieces. You will present their stolen riches to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. This is the word of the Lord inspired by God for us, the children of God. Thanks be to God. To God. Would you pray with me again? Lord, Open our hearts and our minds today, not only to understand more of the scriptures, not to acquire simply more knowledge, but to practice that which we understand. To you be the glory now and forever. Amen. Um, can, I, can I ask a question before we get started? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, man. <clears throat> All right, so the... Uh, Jewish people believe in the Messiah and the Messiah was a return will return. What do they understand about the latter days? Because I don't really recall, uh, you know, from my readings in the Old Testament about separation of the return or of the Messiah and the latter days, or if they're all one, or because obviously in our thought process here, Jesus was the Messiah. He returned, but it's not the latter days. Well, any time, anything after the birth and the events of Jesus is the end of days, is the latter days. Oh, Everything okay. that follows after Jesus for us as Christians is the later days. This is the end. We believe that anything that happened after Jesus' presence is the time before Jesus comes. 
Yeah, but when it's, hang on a second, when it says, in the, he says there then in the latter days that we'll, we will all live in peace. And I don't see a lot of peace going on right now. Because they don't believe that their Messiah has arrived yet. Well, if we believe what the Old Testament also says in mm -hmm. the latter days, then the latter days are not here. No, because we are not. We, we are in the later days, but Jesus has not arrived yet. Has oh, not for returned. the second coming. All right, all right, all right, all right. Because we got a, another coming yet to come. So, all right, I got you. I understand. But what did the Jewish nation understand about that at the end? <laughs> Say that again. Not, what did the Jewish nation? So he, this guy's prophesying. Mm -hmm. You know, G, G, uh, the Messiah has not come back for the first time, and as far as they know, he's only going to come back once because he's going to be their king from a um, more of a kingship type of role than the way he came. And what did they understand about those latter days? Did they understand that it was all going to be like this, the peace and uh, like from- in, 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 my, in my assumption, remember that I, I don't fully understand yet. I have not practiced judaism i'm not a jew um in my understanding in my limited understanding is they believe in the return of um yahweh in the return of the messiah they believe in the messiah coming and trampling uh those who are enemies and setting the world right in favor of god's people so Basically, as Christians and brothers, we expect Jesus, Yeshua's return to set the world right. Um, Micah, obviously, is a prophetic book. And we tend to only believe the prophecies of the book of Revelations, but these are much of the same um, promises of the book of Revelation. Um, they just um, have a different way to understanding and appreciate um, the coming of the Messiah. We believe in Jesus. We believe in his sacrifice. The problem that I see or the circumstances or the challenges is who is their intermediate who who is a person that sets the world right for them because it says here as we will read that god will send someone god will come in judgment and will set the world right we believe in jesus as being the person that intercedes on our behalf who intercedes on behalf of those who do not believe in Jesus? That's a, that's a big question for me as you bring that subject up. Who intercedes on behalf of people? Because by the law, we are all fine. We, we will all be guilty. So who intercedes? If it's not Jesus, who intercedes on your behalf? Today. To anybody. Well, but they don't they uh, cry out, cry out to the Lord directly. Yeah, and what does the Lord say about those who have been a fault, iniquity, those who have done the wrong thing? They will be punished, right? Where is the forgiveness? Where is grace? So it's not just Jesus; is what Jesus represents for Christians. Is the saving grace, is the the love of the Lord. Well, all right. So, and we're getting off track, and I apologize. Well, it's you. You're asking me for things that I don't fully cannot help you understand. Okay, I can help just you one, understand. one one more quick question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, and we can go find it if we have to, and it, we probably don't have time, but. Uh, so when John is preaching in the river, the Jordan, 
Mm -hmm. and he's preaching repentance is he is he also preaching about the about the coming messiah or not i don't recall they they believe in the coming of the messiah no i know but i just want when they said he was pre preaching about repentance if he also said he was repent, uh, preaching about the coming latter days or anything else or well i'll, I'll, I'll go with that. i'm just no 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 what what when when john preaches repentance it, 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 it preaches about people coming to a better relationship with God that simply relying on the killing of animals. Because it was, sim it was a simple transaction. People didn't feel really sorry for what they were doing. They were just buying something, killing it, and washing their hands. So repentance has nothing to do with the killing it has everything to do with desiring a better relationship with christ so when john the baptist is preaching repentance he's also baptizing in water and in the spirit he is asking people to in their heart to repent and to seek a better relationship with god rather than just simply they i'm sorry i'm sorry and now i'm better so i'm going to continue doing the same thing and that's kind of what mike is saying too you know in, in in many ways now pay attention to um I, I took off the screen let me let me give it back to you so we begin where we where we're supposed to begin first verse of chapter four once it shows up in the last days we are living in the last days this is a prophecy from Micah to the people. And remember, who is Micah? Micah is an outsider. Micah is an outsider to whom? To the people of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the people, the northern and southern states. And uh, you remember that they are having a great time, actually. There's a great of uh, the economy is booming, so to speak. And uh, there is a lot of exchange of money. You know how difficult it is to prophesy to a people of God when they're having a good time? <laughs> so in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all. And what do we know about a city on a hill as Matthew Matthew 14, Matthew 5, 14. It will be a, uh, no, that's from Revelations. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Above, it says, uh, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will thrown out and trample underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. So that's that's the context. That is the same message that Micah is trying to communicate to the people of God and to, um, to, to Jerusalem. And he talks about the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills. Not that it will be the only hill, but that it will be placed above all the other hills. And people from all over the world will stream there to worship. This last part there, people from all over the world, it's important as they come to do what? Worship our gracious Lord. So it continues to say, People from many nations will come and say, come, let us go up the mountain of the Lord to the house of Jacob's God, 
there he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his path for the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion, another name for, from, uh, for Jerusalem. His word will go out from Jerusalem. Very important. The Lord will mediate between peoples and he will settle disputes. How, how interesting is to you that even though when the Lord comes and the Lord is still here, he will still need to mediate disputes. According to Micah. For a thousand years, right? Because even after a thousand years, um, there is an uprising and he throws them all in the lake of the fire. Lake of fire. After, after, after Satan is thrown in the pit of fire, there is a thousand years where Jesus will rule with the God's people. Absolutely. Yes. And the minute that Satan is out, there's going to be people who will side with Satan, even though there was a thousand years where Jesus reigned. But how important it is to you is not that Jesus will bring the absence of war. Is that Jesus, the Lord, will be able to mediate disputes between people, between nations, strong nations. That tells you something significant about Christianity and the way that we should behave currently. It's not so much that we should desire a world without violence. It's that we should be able to mediate our problems in the name of God, knowing fully well that we are not perfect in that mediation but God help us to practice forbearance, which is something that we don't do very well. Right. Right. <laughs> but it, it doesn't say that's ever going to happen. It says there will, the Lord will mediate. There is not, I mean, before in the latter days or the end of days or whatever, and for for someone to rise as the Antichrist, there's going to have, in my opinion, it's going to have to be worldwide chaos. And like you said, nobody's going to listen if things are great. But there will be worldwide chaos, and there will be somebody who will eventually turn out to be the Antichrist that yeah. will have the solution. Yeah. Well, let me let me let me ask you this, Dave. As we wait and continue to wait for the arrival of the Messiah, are we as Christians just to sit in a corner and wait for the Messiah? No, you're supposed to do what uh, the Lord told you to do all along. And I'm just not saying, only that, it, no, I'm just no, saying no. When, in order for it to happen, there has to be chaos. Yes, I understand, but we cannot do anything about that chaos. That chaos will happen. Regardless. It will happen. But in the meantime, as we wait for that to happen, as we wait for the Lord's return, Micah doesn't know something that will happen later, which is what that the Lord will live within us. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives where? Within us. So the Lord, God, Yahweh, mediate between peoples and will settle disputes. What is that to say that the Holy Spirit is not only already acting in us, helping us to mediate between disputes? That's the practice here, is that it's not that we should just wait for the Lord to come in a helicopter and fix the problem, which we created. Is that the Lord has already given us authority to mediate relationship between brothers and sisters. And so many Christians, they want God to come and solve the problem. And God has says, that's why I gave you the Holy Spirit. To help you mediate your problems. I mean, we don't have to wait for the Lord to come to begin the process of turning our swords into plowshares. And our spears into pruning hooks. We don't have to wait. The kingdom come. 
part of the kingdom of God is already here in our midst, right? I mean, do you, you believe that the kingdom of God is already at hand? That's a big question. And I, I desire for Christ to come. And I know that judgment is necessarily because of consequences that we have to endure. The promise, ultimate promise of God is on verse 4. Everyone will live in peace and prosperity, enjoying their own great vines and fig trees. For there will be nothing to fear, for the Lord's heaven's armies has made this promise. <clears throat> that sound like foolish wishing thinking that everyone will live in peace and prosperity. Yeah, in today's world, that would be questionable. I mean, do we live without this hope? Do we do we look at the world and we're gloom at this prospect of future life? Or do we believe in this promise that we will live in peace and prosperity? enjoying our own great vines and fig trees. And this is nothing new. This is not this is not a language that is new in the Old Testament. If you pay attention to 1 Kings 4 and 2 Kings 18, you will see that the authors also speak in this regard. In fact, this is not even a prophecy that is unique to Micah. If you go to Isaiah, We go to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 and 3. Pay attention to verse 2. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. Sounds familiar? Almost word by word. Almost, yeah. Isaiah and Micah existed at the same time. And they were talking about the same thing. It's not that judgment is what is necessary, but worship. Worship is the thing that sets us together. The Lord's house will be the highest of all, and it will be a place where people in the world will go there to worship. See, we think judgment is about setting things right, and judgment is about, uh, is about bringing people together to worship. Let me say this. Um, Dave. Yes. There are 24 elders at the beginning of the book of Revelation. And they are just as many elders at the end of the book of Revelations. Their goal is to help us witness not judgment, but worship. The book of Revelation is a book of judgment, yes. But it's a book of how God is going to follow a structure for us, for the people of God, to go there in worship, to finally be together in worship because it's when we are in worship when we get together now many people get together for other reasons yesterday there was a big crowd you don't have to tell people you don't have to advertise halloween you don't have to advertise the giving of candy people know <coughs> Have you ever been in a soccer match outside of United States? No. 
It's too dangerous, right? <laughs> dangerous? What are you talking about? <laughs> you get crushed, crowd, crowd crushed. They just had a, what, 150 people killed in Malaysia or something like that? Yeah. But have you ever killed, have you ever seen somebody killing somebody when they're celebrating a goal? No. When somebody scores, strangers hug each other. And especially when you're from the same team, obviously, you, you cheer and all that. We like to worship things that are not. You know, how many of us sit quietly and attentively watching a game? How many of you were so sad from the weekend? I'm not going to say names. <laughs> <laughs> You're cruel. You're cruel. <laughs> we, we pay so attention to, we are beings. As humans, we are beings who wish to have something bigger than ourselves to celebrate. The World Cup, you know, the World Series. As humans, we tend to gravitate towards bigger things, and we like to celebrate things like that. God with, knows other, this. Yeah, with other people, too. God knows this. And so he has set us together to worship because he knows that that's what moves us, especially when the one that deserves our worship is worthy. We are the ones that just simply have other idols. We make other idols and we worship other things. During worship, says Micah, verse 2. Pay attention to verse 2 right here. I'm going to remove this. And it says, there he will teach us his ways. And he will, and we will walk in his path. It is during worship. Yes, judgment. Yes, the coming of the Messiah. Yes, prosperity and peace. But it is during worship that we learn his ways and we will walk in his path. It's during worship that this happens. Now, pay attention to verse 5. Though the nations around us follow their idols, because there is an existence of idols. There is the Antichrist. Micah is instructing his people to follow the Lord, our God, forever and ever. And how, how do you know? What should you expect when, come, when God comes? Here is a bigger promise. In that coming day, not in the latter days anymore, but in the coming day, when the Lord arrives, he will gather those who are lame, those who have been in exile, and those who have uh, been filled with grief. Pay attention to, they. God is not simply going to gather the strong or the faithful. God is going to gather the lame, the ones that have been in exile and the ones that are filled with grief. And those who are weak will survive as remnant. Those who are in exile will become a strong nation. Then I, the Lord, will rule from Jerusalem as their king forever. This is the hope of the one that is lost. What is, what is this teaching to the Christians today? What sh this is reminding Christians today? That God will always side with those that sit in the outskirts of society. Imagine in a time of Micah, a time where they believe that if you wear lame is because you did something to deserve it and when you were exiled you were not able to come to worship or be part of the community and those filled with grief has no one to care for them widows it, uh, i'm just curious i i just noticed when i looked at that it, and mine reads exactly the same way almost 
and those whom I have filled with grief, or afflicted, mine says, uh, and those, those whom, whom I have afflicted. afflicted. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious about what they had, what they did that he afflicted them, or why they were afflicted by him. Well, you tell who me. Who are those people? Who who are those people? I guess. Well, if God has a power to love, God has also the power to cause damage, right? As Christians, we struggle with God as a violent God. We don't like to think about God. We like to talk, we like to think about God as our friend. We don't like to talk about God as our Lord. So God inflicts discipline on his children. And sometimes he uses the enemies of Israel to inflict that pain, which is what's happening later on in the chapter. I mean, how many of us struggle when God allows bad things happen to good people? We don't yeah. like that. We don't like that. Yeah. We want God to come to the rescue. We want God to love us. But when God exercises discipline, we don't like it. No different than when you are the father of a son or a daughter and you're their best buddies. And when, when you don't give them money or you don't give them what they want, they take that friendship away. And they say, you, I hate you. And that hurts. I mean, all of you have sons and daughters who are older. My sons I'm have not. Older than you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my son, um, my sons, Dante or Nico, have never said I hate you, but I know that they will say it at some point. Yep. Did it hurt when you heard it the first time? I'm sure it did. So when you, if you want to talk about uh, those whom I afflicted, yeah. Don't look too far. Just read the book of Job. It's not that God inflicts the pain. It's that God allows the pain to happen. Why? To allow you to deal with your circumstances. Now, if we go back really quick up there and take that which we just talked about, why if the Lord mediates the problems between us, and God allows us to turn our swords into plowshares. What does that mean? Besides the fact that we will not have swords anymore. If I have a plowshare and you have one, what does that mean? That there's going to be work to do. Well, and there's also going to be, pro there's still going to be problems because he's going to mediate. Them. Yes, but we are going to be busy doing good work. Because you know that one of the fertile grounds for misbehavior is having time. Free time. To sit idle. No. It's not that God is just simply taking our source away. He's giving us a tool to go work. If you are a Christian 
that sits down and wait for things to happen, you are not being part of the will of God. If you are a Christian right now who says, well, I haven't done anything wrong, so I'm just going to sit here and wait until the, the world falls apart, you are not in God's will. You have to participate in the work that is done. That's why you're getting a plow share. That's why God is not simply taking the sword. He's giving you tools, obviously, plowshares and hooks are going to be different because we are not farmers anymore the way that they used to be. So those who I gather who are lame, who have been in exile, who have been filled with grief, now that they have, they're going to have to be able to have tools And look at all these promises. Now pay attention to verse 9. Oh, let's read, read verse 8. As for you, Jerusalem, the citadel of God's people, your royal might and power will come back to you again. The kinship will be restored to my precious Jerusalem. This is all good news. Now pay attention to verse 9. Why this sudden switch? Now, remember in Micah 3, the people of God were telling Micah not to prophesy in this way. That everything was great. But why are you now screaming in terror? Is it possible that some people don't want to God to come because they are having their best life the way it is? How many Christians are having such a good time right now that they do not want Christ to come? How many prophets and ministers and churches you see are thriving that they don't they don't want the Lord to come yet? How many governments are booming by abusing? Have you no king to lead you? Have you no wise people? Have all your wise people all die? What you are, what you and I are experiencing in this world right now are the pain of a child bear. So, verse 10 comes. You people of Jerusalem, from now you must leave this city. Micah just told them of the end result. But they still have to go through the process. Now they're going to be exiled. Now they're going to suffer. Now God is going to allow the pain to be inflicted. And he's going to destroy Jerusalem. He already told you what the end result is going to be. But now you're going to watch it happen from the beginning. You will soon be sent in exile to distant Babylon. Remember, the Lord will rescue there. He will redeem you from the grip of your enemies. Now, your enemies, many nations have gathered against you. Let her be desecrated, Jerusalem. Let the seed of the destruction of Jerusalem. But they do not know the Lord's thoughts and understand his plan. These nations don't know that he is gathering them together to be beaten and trampled like sheaves of grain on a threshing floor. 
So while God is using, while God is using Babylon and others like Babylon to destroy Jerusalem and to flatten Jerusalem, they think that the Lord is going to let them do whatever without being punished, without being and dealing with the consequences of their actions. This is the same message that Habakkuk was preaching. On Sunday, I was limited with time, so I didn't tell you all the things that I wish I could have told you, but Habakkuk is a prophet that doesn't tell the people of Israel about the, the wrong that they're doing. Habakkuk is a, a, a prophet who is pleading with God to say, okay, I know that we're not doing the right thing, but why would you send Babylon to punish us? Babylon is far worse than we are. And God says, you're just going to have to have faith in me. I know what I'm doing. You're going to have to face the discipline, the consequences of your actions, and I'm going to use them. But when they are done, I am also going to give you victory over them. This is the, the cool stuff that the, um, you get from the Old Testament is that God is not telling you that it's just going to be flowers and rainbows and butterflies. God is telling you that he is going to walk through the process with you. Same reason why he sent our Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross. There is a process that you have to go through. And Christians do not like that process. No more than the people of Israel like that process. So as Christians, we should pray not for a happy ending, but a purposeful life. Verse 13 tells you again what the Lord will use. So if Babylon now is inflicting pain in Jerusalem, Jerusalem will rise up and crush the nations in the name of the Lord. Now, Micah is difficult to digest if you only read Micah. You have to have an understanding of the hope of the world. You have to read the Old Testament with Christ in mind. Because without Christ, we have nothing but the law. And by the law, we are all found guilty. How do we begin today living the life, living into the calling of Micah? By gathering for worship. Worship has the power to set things right. For us to Walk in God's way. To learn his ways. But people don't believe that. Most people think that worship is about them. It's about the music that they want. It's about their feeling well. It's about them gaining something. Have you ever heard the church shopping mentality? where people go from church to church and they are like shopping. Mm -hmm. Well, I have, I have seen this, this thing online that says, stop looking for a perfect church. Go to worship a perfect God. When you start reading the prophets, it's not easy. And often you fail to understand 
all of their prophecies. So today I want to remind you who and what is the fulfillment, the fulfillment of all the prophecies found in the Old and the New Testament. Jesus Christ. Jesus. All the prophets predicted the coming of the Messiah. And as you read the book of Revelations, you will know that while Christ came as an infant, his return will not be as an infant. Christ will return in glory with strength and power to call us into worship and for allowing the world and allowing the world to deal with the consequences of our actions. The prophets are fascinating as chapters predict the coming and the resolution of Christ. Now, Micah 4 tells you that God will be helping us to practice forbearance and to find resolution. What did Christ teach us already about how to deal with our enemies? We turn the other cheek. And many, many other things. See, Christians can either wait for God to come again, or they can begin to do what they know already that God desires from them. I don't know. I kind of want to bury my Mina in the ground, wait for him to come back <laughs> and give it to him. <laughs> you can do that. But what is the story saying about burning your thing by the tree? And what do the owner say when it happens? And he says, what did you do with what I gave you? <clears throat> I protected it. I, I kept, kept it for you. <laughs> yeah, my friends. Micah is calling us to worship. To go to the citadel up in the hill and come to worship. Now, all of you come to worship. How are we inviting the rest of the people? our friends, our neighbors. It's important for us to gather for worship. The pandemic gave us a way out online and online is good when you are unable to go to worship. But when you are al already able and nothing is really stopping you from coming to worship, the benefit is being together, praising God together. Online makes it possible but it's not the same it is the same as eating takeout and going to a restaurant to be served and to serve others watching online gives you much of the experience but it's not the same a lot of church happens before and a lot of church happens after. Did you know that our worship on Sunday was two hours long? Sure. Worship began, worship began at 1030. But we didn't stop worshiping until about 130. When people went home, actually. Because the fact that we sat down around tables and we chatted and we talked and we heard and we met the new members. And we, we, we saw the video that the kids made for, for me and um, to celebrate Pastor's Appreciation Month and all these things. That was all worship. So thanks be to God. You know, that's why Gary's cooking is a ministry. Mm -hmm. You can call it the holy chicken. Tastes so good. <laughs> oh, but it's 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 fascinating how Micah is telling us there will be judgment, 
but God calls us today to worship. And it's in worship that God resolves those questions. And if you are not worshiping God, then you're missing his presence in your life. That's what I have for today, my friends. Final thoughts, questions? Well, you sent me a text? No, oh, George. George. Okay. All right. Well, my friends, may the peace of God, his strength, and his spirit be with you always. Have a good day.